The element of surprise can be a powerful advantage in warfare. By the latter stages of the Clone Wars, a Republic victory seemed inevitable, and the Separatists appeared to be trapped in a series of sieges in the Outer Rim. While victory in those battles was proving to be attritional, the military spending and requisition bills passing through the Senate, coupled with increasing outputs of clone troopers, ensured that momentum was with the Republic. It was at this point that Count Dooku and General Grievous staged the audacious and potentially war-winning raid on Coruscant, the galactic capital. The Republic's most battle-hardened forces had been drawn to the Outer Rim, leaving the interior relatively undefended. Utilizing secret hyperspace routes through the galactic core, the Separatist fleet was able to arrive at Coruscant without warning. With the Coruscant home defense fleet outmaneuvered, General Grievous led an expedition to the Senate District, took Chancellor Palpatine hostage, and returned to orbit. If the Separatist fleet had successfully escaped at this point, the capture of Palpatine would almost certainly have forced the Republic to the negotiating table. Victory was within the Separatists' grasp. Instead, Dooku delayed and kept his fleet in orbit. The battle above the planet became increasingly chaotic as Republic Venator-class Star Destroyers clashed with Separatist Munificent-class frigates and Lucrehulk-class battleships. Lines of battle did not simply become blurred, they began to overlap in three dimensions as capital ships from both sides attempted to gain elevation over the opposition using Coruscant's atmosphere as a foundation. Packed in close together, the weapons of these ships could be used to devastating effect in full broadsides as vessels passed each other. The Republic forces fought to ensure that the Separatist fleet, particularly Grievous's flagship the Invisible Hand, could not extricate itself from the battle. The Separatist battle plan was less apparent, but it appeared they also seemed intent on crippling the enemy fleet above the capital. Regardless of these overarching strategies, the battle itself swiftly descended into local actions between nearby warships with fighter support on both sides filling the vacuum between them. At this point, any coherent control from the commanders on both sides began to break down. Ships fired on targets of convenience or proximity rather than military worth. The weaponry of both Republic and Separatist fleets was designed to facilitate space combat at various distances. During the Battle of Coruscant, all of these weapons, even the longest range turbo lasers, were utilized at extremely close quarters, inflicting devastating damage. Turbo laser batteries, mass drivers, and torpedoes were able to target enemy ships at point blank range and tear through shields and hull armor. The largest capital ships could survive such assaults for a limited period, but lighter frigates and support vessels could be split in two by a single broadside attack. The Separatist frigates and battleships made use of heavy deck guns to cause enormous damage to enemy targets. Built-in ion cannons disrupted the shields of Republic vessels, allowing the heavy round from the mass driver cannon to pass through undisturbed and puncture the hull. Even the heaviest capital ships on both sides could not survive long against sustained fire like this. As the battle raged, the space above Coruscant became choked with shattered hulks and flaming wreckage. The capture of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine threatened the entire Republic war effort. News that Coruscant was under siege was enough to bring Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker back from Yerbana with their strike force to assist in the battle. The two fleets were already fully engaged when the two Jedi arrived, but they were able to make the most of the confusion of battle to hone in on General Grievous's flagship, the Invisible Hand. The pair fought through Separatist droid fighter squadrons to reach the ship at the cost of many of the clone pilots escorting them. Once aboard, Kenobi and Skywalker were able to navigate up through the vessel to the main viewing platform where Palpatine was held hostage. Upon their arrival, they were confronted by Count Dooku, head of state for the Confederacy of Independent Systems. The rescue of Palpatine on the Invisible Hand by Obi-Wan and Anakin precipitated the battle swinging decisively in the Republic's favor. 
Not only did they ensure the Supreme Chancellor's safety, but in a lightsaber duel, Anakin killed Count Dooku. Following a battle on the Bridge of the Invisible Hand between the Jedi and General Grievous, the Separatist flagship's control functions were destroyed and the vessel became easy prey for nearby Star Destroyers. Ravaged by internal explosions, the Invisible Hand fell out of orbit, and although General Grievous and some of the Separatist fleet were able to escape, many ships were left trapped between the Republic Navy and Coruscant itself and forced to surrender. What should have been a dramatic and decisive Separatist victory had turned into a rout. While forces remained in action in the Outer Rim, the bulk of the fleet deployed to Coruscant was lost and could not easily be replaced. In the aftermath, Republic military officials pored over footage of the battle in a bid to discern the Separatist strategy. Why had they stayed in the system so long after capturing Palpatine? What none realized was that escape had never been Dooku's plan. The Clone Wars were being orchestrated by two Sith Lords, one on each side, Count Dooku and his master, Chancellor Palpatine. Palpatine had used the battle purely as bait to lure Anakin Skywalker back to Coruscant, dispose of Dooku, and prepare the Republic for its final days. Thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it, and may the force be with you.